party. Hello, welcome to From the Rookery End, the first proper podcast of the season, 7.3 of our seventh season. Uh, My name is John, with me is Jason. Hello, John. And Michael. Oh, very nice of you to lower yourself (laughs) to uh, joining uh, joining us mere mortals, John. Hi. Um, Yes, I have decided to do so. Yeah, I must say, I must say, I think I speak on behalf of you, Jace, as well. Congratulations! I thought he did a fabulous job um, in speaking with Troy um, for the new website. It was uh, it was enlightening as well. And uh, did you did you find it enlightening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it, when you if you, everyone don't know, if, if you go to the new WatfordFC.com, um, there's an interview that I did. Um, the, I was honoured to be asked by the club to um, to spend some time uh, with Troy. It's about 30, 35 minutes long. And you can, you know, interviewing Troy as we've done on the podcast is, is a very easy thing because he's a very open sort of a chap. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was great to watch back. Even though, as you mentioned, he uh, we've we've spoken to him before. I was excited when I knew he did it because I knew he'd get some great stuff out of him. I think one of the things that really struck it struck a chord with me was it was how positive he was about Matty Vidra. Yeah. And for me, that really opened a, a sort of can of worms because I was kind of resigned to Vidra going again, not making the cut. But Troy talking in such glowing terms got me thinking. And he's very persuasive, is Troy, isn't he? He said, I think we need him. I was like, do you know what? I think we do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think uh, he's very much back on the agenda. Well, we'll, we'll chat about Matt, Matty Vidra. In fact, he didn't appear on Saturday, uh, even though he was on the bench, um, because Watford uh, had the first game of the season away at Southampton. It was a 1-1 draw, uh, and this is the night after Sunday night. Um, Jason, uh, my gut says you're going to say, oh, we're taking a draw at the beginning of the game. But having known the, the performance a bit more in terms of how the 1-1 came about. Happy with that result, or that, that performance, rather than just the result? I'd have taken a draw at the beginning of the game. Um, and yeah, you would, especially when you go down to 10 men for, for even for 15 minutes uh, away from home. Southampton has been a, it's been a strange place for us, hasn't it, in recent years. We've done really well there, or really badly. We haven't scored against them for seven years before Saturday. Is that is that right? Yeah, we came up against a, a, a juggernaut the last time I think we played him in the championship. Yeah. You've got to say, both teams had a new manager. We're playing a new formation. Pre-season was a bit wobbly. I must admit, I was a bit worried after the, the Lorient friendly. There's a, a sinkhole opened up in Vicarage Road, and I was fully expecting that to have to be used as some sort of analogy with our defence after Saturday's game. But no, the, the guys did well. And it was that solid group of players from last season, wasn't it, that, that, that did it? When you saw that starting lineup, Mike, the fact it was there was no new boys in that in that lineup, yeah. was that uh, a thank goodness or was that a oh maybe things aren't going to progress? Uh, I think there was reasons behind them all, weren't they? Obviously, Isaac's success was injured. I wouldn't expect him to him to start anyway. Decoure was the one that I think most people were expecting to see um, in from the start, but he was suspended, so there, there was obviously a reason behind that. So I was interested. I thought it felt it, it felt quite an attacking lineup um, with Amrabat and Holabas doing the uh, the wing back roles. You knew that both of them are good going forward. I was slightly worried about how they'd how they'd handle their defensive duties. But yeah, I thought I was quite excited by it. And we talk about talk about pre season. It's funny how quickly all that melts away once it's two fifty nine on on a Premier League match day. It's all you know. You forget all that, um, and it's just so exciting. The adrenaline's pumping again. But yeah, your original question. No, I wasn't worried that there was no no new faces. We're about building a squad. It's about a long term uh, build. Um, it's about getting Watford incrementally better. Uh, and those players will come in uh, when when they're good and ready. Decore, I'm very much looking forward to uh, coming in. Would he have made a difference yesterday? I'm I'm not sure, but I think yeah, I think a point was a good result. Certainly one would have taken before the game. And if you take into account the, the pattern of play, Southampton sort of got more and more into it as the game went on. They really bossed the second half, and we were hanging on a, li- a little bit after Watson Watson got sent off. So to to, 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 to earn a draw like that that's somewhere we haven't had much luck in in recent years I think is really really encouraging watching the game at the ground I sort of went 
I felt wobbly at the beginning with nerves, but then there was a bit of a wobble on the pitch. I didn't feel as comfortable for the first first five minutes. Um, but we, we, we sort of sorted ourselves out and we got the early goal. And then for about 20 minutes after that, it was like, oh my God, this is a confident Watford team passing the ball around. It's going where it should be going. Um, we were controlling that game for about 20 minutes. And then Southampton started to dictate for maybe the last 15 minutes of the, of the first half and then pretty much the whole of the second half. It wasn't like we were sort of the, the, bu- the bus was parked very early on um, but the chance of them scoring was much greater than us scoring um, and then when Watson went off um, it, it certainly felt like there was a, a limit of the sub- the substitutions that were made were to, yeah. to to counter that rather than hey let's put Definitely. someone on that might actually get us a win even though they're, they're, they're doing what they're doing yeah. we might still be able to turn things around I don't think there was any ever question any question that Matsari was going to go for the win certainly after after Watson got, got sent off but I think it, it's important to remember we're playing against another Premier League team with, with excellent players so we shouldn't be surprised that at home they turned the screw against us. They had a bit of a rocky start, and yeah, I mean, like you say, Watford played some of the some really, really silky stuff. Some of the stuff that the supporters were saying yesterday, uh, some of the best passages of play they've seen um, from a team in yellow for for a long, long time. So, it's the first game of the season, um, and I think the, the the only dissenting voices I've heard um, have really been about Holabas defensively. Perhaps um, I think Amrabat was a pleasant surprise. The link between midfield and, and and getting the ball forward, how are we going to get some service to, to Iggy and Troy, who both had sort of forlorn days, really. Troy Troy's little cushioned header for the for the goal was great, um, but Igalo sort of cut a lone furrow, didn't he, at, at, at top, who just didn't get any service. And that's really, it's, I think, as it stands, is is going to be the make the crux of our season. How do we How do we build that? How do we get that creativity in? Guardiola played yesterday, which I know a lot of people have been pleased about, um, but set slightly deeper um, and wasn't able to sort of provide that that creative spark, that little link to to get either Troy or, or Igalo going. So, yeah, there's obviously it's, it's it's encouraging. It's a great start. Don't lose your first game. Watch you going back to your Troy interview, John. I think that it was. Um, I think it was telling how he how he felt it was so important not to lose your first game. He, he referenced the game at Everton, and I didn't realise quite how much store was placed on. Don't lose your first game. Never lose your first game. So with that in mind, job done. Yeah, and it was. Um, I went to uh, the game with uh, Paul from Denver, who we're going to hear from next week, um, who's over at the moment, and um, he's got his whole little, which we could talk about next week. He's got a very. Um, what he thinks is going to happen throughout the season and why and he's planned it out um, but he had he has no points for the first five games <laughs> so we're one up already um, and that, that's got to be a good thing we asked a lot of you on, on our Twitter which is at Watford Podcast um, what, should we, what should we talk about tonight and a, a big part of it comes down to um, what is Matty Vidra after what Troy said um, in the interview uh, on the club website I, he didn't come on he was definitely warming up, and I think he would have come on if Watson hadn't been sent off. Jason, are you, because you're a bit more mature and a bit more <laughs> uh, 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 less rational, uh, irrational than, than, than most of us, do, does he need that chance? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think if, um, if there's a question as to what he could bring to this Watford side, the irony is look at what Shane Long did to to Ben Watson mm. and that's exactly the sort of uh, impact that Vidra can bring, bring to, to Watford that there's nothing wrong with, uh, with with getting the ball forward quickly that break came from a, a Watford call I think a couple of passes and he was away or would have been away if Watson hadn't uh, done the proper professional job on him that, that he did <laughs> um, and I just have to say without going too much off topic great effort from Amrabat in trying to convince the referee that he was yeah, the yeah. last man yeah, yeah. He, was, he, was, he was unlucky I thought Amrabat there um, but no that's exactly what, what Vidra can bring as we know it's, it's not rocket science um, so I think yes he should be given a chance because of what he can bring the, the, the question is and I think uh, probably still is we asked the question pre-season is one or are one of the other guys the guys that come in um success or Sinclair are they that option instead of Vidra I don't know but at the moment there's nothing to say they're any better than Vidra I think the, the telling thing was from again going back to your interview John this will be the last time I mention it sorry <laughs> if you haven't seen it do go and watch it because then I can stop talking about it but um he said uh, he said Matt C. Vidra has grown up 
Yeah. Um, and he said, when Troy said he's spoken to him, he said that it's never been about his talent. That's never been in doubt, which I think some people have been confused about. Uh, the, 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 the Watford management or the Watford head coach doesn't think he's good enough. And I don't think that's ever been the question. I think it's always been a question of his temperament. Um, and Troy Deeney was very clear. He said he sulks. And when he sulks, he's no use. And we've kind of seen that. There's been games that I'm sure Matthew Vidra will be honest if he looks back and said, yeah, I had my head up my backside. I was no good to anyone. If he can get that, you know, that's a big change, a big step change to, t- to change your, your psyche and you have to change sort of kind of everything in your life, don't you, to, to change something where in your job you're having re- off days quite often, which he was. So obviously a lot of things had to change. And it's whether he's managed to do that. So whether it's his relationship outside football, whether it's his approach to training, um, money, where he lives, there could be anything that impacts on on a footballer's life and and therefore performance. And that is a really big question, whether he's got himself straight enough to deliver for an entire Premier League campaign when we probably will have rough, rough trots. Um, I'm sure, you know, there'll be injuries and suspensions along the way for everyone. He might have to fill in somewhere else. He might miss a sitter one game. He might miss a penalty. He might um, not get the rub of the green. All the little things, all the little triggers that could set him back to the old Matty Vidra. And can we afford that? I think that's the question. And it's how we know. And I think we won't know until the squad's announced. I think if the squad's announced, he will have impressed a lot because he's got some making up to do, I think, because he's been, he's went to West Brom and failed. He went to Reading and failed. And the reason he was allowed to go on both occasions was because he wasn't doing the right thing at Watford either. So, in effect, he's disappointed at three clubs over the last sort of three or four seasons. So, for him to be maintained in this Premier League squad, I think he will have had to impress hugely. And if he does, I think we'll see a lot of him. And... That raw pace that Jace was just talking about is so exciting. You see little brief snippets of it in the, in the pre-season friendlies where defenders like, Jesus, where did he come from? And he's just, it could only be over a couple of yards, but he'll nip in and he'll rat it out and, and bef- it's too late. We've seen it. But there's a much bigger issue. It's not his talent. It's his temperament. Is that fixed? I think Matsari and the staff will talk to people who have been around the club for a while. They will get their heads together. And I think it's going to be close. I hope he does. Because we've all got fond memories of him. We all know what he can do. His finishing is can be extraordinary. His pace is ridiculous. Can he get his head straight? Well, he tweeted yesterday after the game that he was uh, to thank the Watford fans for chanting his name. Um, he did it as he sort of came over for a warm down um, at the end of the game. A podcast made by Watford fans, fans. for Watford fans. From the rookery end. The, the, the other sort of, the kind of thing that come, came up, Jason, after yesterday's game, and definitely after the game, was the lack of English that uh, Volta has. <laughs> you, is, is it a problem? It, it could be. It's not going to be um, as... What's that? I'm not sure what, the, what word I'm looking for, but it, it, you it, it's... <laughs> I know, and this, this is probably Volta's problem. Um, if he could speak English, then... That would be fine, even if one or two things need translating in the dressing room. That's already a little bit more of a problem, probably, than an English-speaking coach. So yes, it probably is a problem. What worries me a little bit is the fact that he was meant to have been here for a year, mm. learning English. Um, now, English is a very, very difficult language to learn, as we, we, as we prove on a weekly <laughs> basis. <laughs> as I'm struggling right now, yeah, and and a lot more difficult than than us learning a, a, another foreign language. Apparently, but there is a, so but I'm the, told. But but there is a difference, I think, though, from learning uh, a language to have the uh, to be able to speak it in a changing room to people who you know, and the yeah. the worry about doing this in front of the media and saying the wrong thing. I, I don't know if that's true. If they if, if he's using a translator to in the, particularly those situations. Um, maybe that that is a thing because surely there's a there's a there's learning English and there's learning the language of football. Yeah. You know, offside, mate. Yeah. You know, okay. man on. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. got to be a, there's a limited footballing phraseology that you need <laughs> yeah. to need to learn. I, yeah, I understand the point about talking to the media and making sure you you get that right and coming across well with the media because you have to obviously get absolutely slaughtered. Um, but then on on sort of on the flip side of that in the dressing room, you've got several nationalities of, of players in there 
um, so some whose understanding of English would be very different to others uh, and if we're suggesting that he's not using a translator in there and sort of just using what he knows things could be interpreted very differently and and it could be a real sort of hodgepodge of uh, of instructions being sent out to the players. Well, I don't think you're going to... The way he was acting on the sideline, um, the, the suit jacket was on, um, but not for long, um, while he was, it w- was shouting and expressing himself. Reminded me a little bit, though, Michael, yeah. of Juan Beppe. Well, sort of, I think. And I think the reason he's been brought in is for similar reasons. I think they brought him in for, for discipline. Um, so I think if something's going wrong, he will make himself known. I think it smacks of a bit of Pochettino when he came to Southampton and he would use a translator for a long time, longer than a lot of people expected. And the general consensus was he can speak English. He's just not confident unleashing it on the public yet. And I think there's a little bit of that. I think his English is probably better than he's letting on, but uh, he doesn't want to. He just doesn't want to be doing it. Um, Beppe, yeah, he was sort of. God, it seems a long time ago now, <laughs> doesn't it? Uh, but very, you know, gesticulations on the on the sideline and that that Italian temperament. I quite like it, and I think yesterday it felt like there was a bit of a bond between the Watford uh, Watford supporters. Everyone quite, you know, you look at Liverpool and Klopp, and I think he's 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 fused a bond quite quickly with the Liverpool supporters by the way he's worn his heart on his sleeve, and he's been very, you know, he looks like he enjoys being there. He looks like it means something, and I think yeah, with Matt Sarri, it sounds we may not get the get the same sort of um, cuddly, feely sound bites that we got from from Kike, but we, we're going to get it in different ways by the looks of things. One of the um, the things that frustrated Watford fans so much with Gianluca Vialli was that he was so much the opposite, so sort of dispassionate and yeah. really unanimated and just sat on the bench all the time. So no doubt that uh, Watford fans will be a lot more happier with someone who shows so much passion on the sideline. I certainly felt a little less. Let's you know, going back to Beppe. I felt a le- a less of a connection with him um, compared to other managers, and I worry um, in a much more pressurised situation that is the Premier League. Um, if we're not hearing from from Volta, um, and it, I don't mean hearing his words or reading his words and reading what he says and hear someone else say his words, literally word for word, when you hear him say it with his tone and his feelings and his emphasis. But there was a huge amount of emphasis from that touchline on Saturday. From the rookery end. Also Saturday, the first competitive goal for Etienne Capu. Now, Mike, your second name is Parkin, and you have a son called Arlo. This is our brand new feature. It's called Michael Parkinson. Arlo, you've seen yesterday's performance, Watford 1, Southampton 1. How did you think Watford played and what did you think of Etienne Capu's goal? Very good because he scored it in the right corner. And what did you think of Watford altogether? Good. We're the Orns, you're the Orns. Come on, you Orns! Uh, the first edition of Golden Pages, the Watford fanzine in its second season now, is out on Saturday. You can grab it um, at the Chelsea game. Uh, it is the eighth edition. Earlier on, I caught up with uh, David Anderson, the editor, and asked him what is going to be in this eighth edition. It's got a bit of a new layout this time. So we've got a fancy content where you can see everything that's in the issue. And a few of the highlights, we've got a review of Hornet Heaven, season one. Um, and we've also got our... Q&A with Ollie Wickham this time, who's the creator of Hornet Heaven, of course. They so he give us a bit of an insight into that. We've also got a farewell letter to Hal Nabdi, written by Joe Young. Uh, when you read the letter, did you cry? Oh, I haven't stopped crying since he left, to be honest. So. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit more than I was than, than, uh, before, but yeah, it's painful, painful to read. Yeah, we've also got a roundup of his best goals, celebrations, tweets, Instagram posts. We've also got a few, obviously he's not the only exit from what this summer. So we've got a big article on Jurexit, which split the country this summer. Um, it's about Gerardo's exit from Watford SC, which is written by Lewis Decker, which is very topical and um, probably slightly more splitting than the other big exit of the summer. And we've also got Tom Wicks, who's written a set of rules for Walter Mazzari um, under the 
title of the Posfather. Okay, what, no, what's, the, what's the most important rule you think he's put in there? You can't go much wrong with rule number two, I'd say, which is Troy is the key to the dressing room. Okay. Get him on your side because Troy is priceless. And I think it's very important. I think the Mazzari hasn't gone too far wrong with that so far. Cool. What else? The Magnificent 17 by Adrian Pearl, which is a concept idea for a new film which could have come out, which would have rivaled, I think, Cool Runnings and the like. It's illustrated with a couple of pictures of Troy Dean in her Elio Gomez and Cowboy hat, so it's worth purchasing for that alone, maybe. Adrian Pearl has also written another piece called A New Hope, which is uh, along the lines of the Pozzo Empire, Emperor Gino, and the Football League Senate. That's a little bit of a um, teaser for that one. So how can we get hold of uh, Golden Pages um, at the Chelsea game? Uh, we'll be outside the ground, mainly on Vicarage Road, and we'll try and get somebody behind the river if we can. But on each corner of the Vicarage Road stand, you'll be able to find one of us. And if you're not at the game, head over to our website, which is goldenpagesandine.com, and you can click on a link to our store where you can have either one issue delivered to your house or you can subscribe and we'll send them out each time we come out. We've got a a couple of pages that we've we've written, Michael. Um, Your one was all about the people who... Well, the whole the whole emphasis on our, 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 our bits that we did were all about transfers and, and things transferring away from Watford. You did about people who transferred who we really wanted to transfer very quickly away. Yeah, it was in the, uh, it was in the direct aftermath of Alman Abdi leaving. Um, and we said, right, OK, we're sorry to see him go. Uh, but who, who, are, who are supporters been happy to see the back of? Uh, and crikey, people were very, very quick <laughs> to tell us who they were, who were happy to see the back of. So I used um, people's responses. They mostly came in via Twitter uh, and used those to construct a sort of rogues gallery, if you like, for... Uh, um, for the fanzine, yeah, which I'm looking forward to seeing what people uh, think about. It's, it's quite fun to do, actually, because you're looking back at the, some of the signings we've made and you think, oh, my God, they were an absolute disaster. And it makes you think, well, all right, the transfers have been a bit hit or miss this this time round, but none quite as bad as some of the names uh, that, that made the finished article. Uh, my bit I wrote about was about a uh, Watford fan who almost transferred himself away from being a Watford fan and being a Luton fan. Uh, it's one of our objects from our 100 objects list. And, uh, yeah, you can find out about how someone... I actually tried quite hard to not be a Watford fan for one afternoon. Jason, you wrote about the success. Um, how, how, how are we having it for the season without saying that word <laughs> <laughs> and not feel like I'm being a pun meister? Yeah, um, about how um, successful the, the pots have been in the in the transfer windows over the last four years. Yes, we looked at success and failure, and we sort of. Um it's finally, come, finally coming in on loan as well from Granada. <laughs> <laughs> I think he plays right back for Real Madrid. So. Um, yeah, we, we we talked quite a lot about the, uh, or sorry, I wrote quite a lot about the uh, uniqueness of uh, of the Pozzos and and the loans we had in those those early years, and how things have sort of normalised over the seasons as we as we sort of got through and got to the Premier League. So you can get a copy of that, as David said, um, and should be on one of the corners of the ground on Vicarage Road, uh, maybe down by Occupation Road at the bottom. Um, but uh, do pick up a copy uh, this Saturday before the Chelsea game. Galo, oh, always believe in your soul. You got the power to know you indestructible. Always believe in Galo. Oh. You're listening to From the Rookery End. Thank you as always uh, for getting involved. Uh, a lot of the points we talked about today came from uh, you guys on Twitter. Uh, particular thanks to uh, Marcus Shapiro, uh, Michael Thomas, uh, Lizzie P. Uh, we would love to have a drink uh, with uh, Adam Vesey's £500 he won on a Kapu and a 1-1 bet yesterday. Uh, also thanks to uh, Phil B, uh, Steve Maguire, the Hornet effect, Maximilian Bell. Peter Ryan I want to flag up. He has a very important question that I think we can cover off very quickly. Hello Peter, you asked top button, done up or undone? When, uh, when, when the shirt was revealed, my brother and his mate both thought the shirt looked pretty ugly and then they when they sort of looked into it in detail they realized they only thought it looked ugly because Deany had the button done up on his mm. rather muscly neck and it just made it look a bit weird so yeah, undone so, so if you've got a big muscly neck undone <laughs> otherwise you could probably get away with having it done up my hope would be as they're walking out onto the pitch it's all done up it's nice and neat and then once they've done the handshakey bit then they can go and do other things but you know looking neat as you go out Socks up properly, and if I'm really honest, shirt tucked in.
Okay, so there you go, Peter. As long as you start out looking neat and well, well turned out, then it doesn't really matter. Also, thanks to uh, Pete Fincham uh, and also David Small. Uh, remember, you can get in touch with us in many different ways. Uh, on all your social media, we are at Watford Podcast or email us podcast at from the rookery end dot com. Yeah, Oz Hornet also got in touch. Uh, he just said, um, to about transfers, I'm, 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 sh- I'm sure, Mike, when he just said Suarez. Yeah, Suarez question mark. He left it hanging. I think we know what he means, though, because it, um, there's a little bit of speculation that Suarez might be going out on loan for a year, um, which... I don't know. I don't feel massively surprised about. I don't feel massively disappointed about. I feel mildly concerned in as much as it's another player who's come in with a decent pedigree. um, Someone who's obviously got a degree of talent and hasn't really been able to perform. But are we giving these guys long enough? Are we giving them a big enough chance in their preferred role? We know, we've said it before, that in the Premier League it takes players quite a long time to settle. Um, We've seen players turn their careers around, but it's taken a year, it's taken 18 months. The best of the best, you know, Henri, Burkamp, those guys, it took them a while to to, to get used to the Premier League. So are we expecting too much of these uh, these guys? Um, So The bit for me is we have a limited number of foreign places and he, against QPR, he was sort of trying to play that number 10, that sort of one man behind the the two up front and it just really didn't work uh so he needs to play somewhere different and if you then said to me or if i asked you mike you know he's gonna play at the the back of of the of the five uh would you put him above ben watson valon barami and etty no exactly so there you go when you're playing that numbers game i can completely see why he's not playing yeah. and possibly going yeah. uh jason um the 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 one player i'm really looking forward to just so I can do this quite regularly, um, is uh, a, a young player coming in from uh, Chelsea called Kennedy. Kennedy! Kennedy! Any WWE fans out there will get that? Everyone else? Just won't. Um, interesting, we get the, the, this lone, uh, another Chelsea lone player um, coming in after Aki last year. Yep. Well, let's uh, let's let's just clarify at the moment is there's nothing uh, signed and sealed, so yeah. it's still still rumours. Um, but yeah, interesting interesting decision if he does come in because um, we think he's predominantly a, a sort of left sided player, wing back type player, which would suggest he'd come in for Holabas. I've sort of already said this this season that I think Holabas could be an important player for us, but at the moment there are question marks over his defensive um, abilities so perhaps he is going to be a, a better option at left wing back or as he seems to be quite an attacking player and um, Matsari doesn't seem to be afraid to to move these players around that can play football is he going to see him as a as a possible option for the number 10 role um, obviously Perea is, is still out there at the moment apparently seems to have uh, Come back online. So one thing I only know, I only found out yesterday was that the Potsos had sold him Pereira, like not that long ago. He's our he's our Paul Pogba. <laughs> Stormzy, if you're out there, get get tuned up, mate. We might need you to do another little uh, <laughs> reveal video. Um, but yeah, I think the all the all the a lot of the correspondence we've had and asking us to talk about has been that that number ten and where is the answer going to come? Um, the, the the guys we're talking about Pereira. Um, and uh, Kennedy don't feel like a, a natural fit, um, but yeah, it sounds like it, you know we're, the, we are running out of time. It is an obvious place where we need we need something to happen. So could one of these guys fit the bill? I don't know. Jace seems to think maybe. Well, it's going to cost yeah. money anyway. Uh, maybe with Kennedy. The good thing about Kennedy is that he is uh, a youngster, so he doesn't count towards our quota of seventeen. Mm. So he or our quota of twenty-five even. He doesn't have to be named in the squad. So uh, he's a uh, Almost a freebie, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's exactly going to cost us a freebie. The he's only thing to... that I would say about Perea is that it does feel a little bit like he's not 100% sold on, on coming to Watford. And I'm not sure whether we've met the, the asking price. I, I don't think he's in Juventus's plans, is he? I think he's, he has played pre-season. That's probably been to keep him fit, keep him in the shop window. Um, but my understanding is he's not, he's not going to be a regular there. They're, they're happy for him to go. So if Watford have met the valuation, you know, this one's rumbled on through pretty much throughout the summer, hasn't it? It's been a name that's been been around and I think people have been excited by because it's Juventus and, you know, they've they've got 
that speaks for itself, really. Um, but we've seen the issues with with Holobast and and slight issues with Berghaus, which which Troy Deeney alluded to in in his video. He, it was interesting, wasn't he? he? Talked about what people don't see behind the scenes. He says, everyone, why isn't this guy playing? Why isn't that guy playing? Uh, it did make me laugh. He said, well, th we didn't find them in a park. <laughs> they're all excellent footballers. That's an absolute given that they're talented. All of them, theoretically, deserve a starting place. But there are reasons why not. And he, and he did point the finger a little bit about at Berghaus. And, and we know Holobas had an issue. So is he going to come in and be a little bit, <sighs> you know, I've come from Turin to the Harla Turin. <laughs> Uh, oh god that was awful sorry <laughs> that, 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 late, late on a Sunday night but you know what I mean we don't want a cold starter especially if he's going to be integral to us so he, he may well prove me wrong you'd like to think he would you'd like to we've well, got to sign him first but that's my only little concern yeah. about that one but interesting is like I said the thing that sort of changed me yesterday was learning that he had also already worked with the Pozzos so that he has a relationship with them already um, but the, my biggest thing is a player like him who is on yes he may be playing for a Serie A side but he's not going to be part of their plans come and play in the biggest league in the world come and show your stuff and get your move elsewhere you know, you, you know you, we want you to play the best at this club come and play the best you can be so you can get more from it and we get more from it and a, a, a professional footballer will always tell you they want to be playing football and if he's not going to be playing uh, that often at Juventus you can probably imagine he's going to be starting most games for us if he joins uh, we have Chelsea next um, and we'll be back for a podcast uh, next week to see how that game goes. Our first home game against Chelsea, who unfortunately are the only, them and uh, West Ham are the only teams on the Premier League that we haven't actually had a look at this weekend. No, but I think we know they're going to be decent, aren't they? They're going to, not going to be the Chelsea uh, of last year. I think Conte is... Well, Kante and Conte are huge <laughs> signings for for Chelsea. The manager will have them licked into shape. He did, did, did good stuff with Italy. I think we're going to find it very difficult, but what an exciting prospect. I was going to almost had a go at you there, John. You're like, yeah, we'll be back next week for, for Chelsea. Chelsea at home <laughs> in the Premier <laughs> yeah, yeah, League yeah, yeah, for yeah, Watford. Yeah. The sun will be shining. Um, the ground will be gleaming. We've been up, I know a lot of people have been sort of up there during the summer and watching it take shape. Uh, it's starting to look like a like a really top class ground. Someone did ask what the building work was between the various corners. I think we'll it was the Graham Taylor and the uh, Vicarage Row stand. The fact that the screen was down, but yeah. I've no idea. I assume there's just a, there's an upgrade going in there. Um, uh, so yeah, it's going. It's just going to be great. Everyone will be excited to be back. I think the Vicarage Road will be looking shiny and new, and there'll be little extra developments that I'm sure people will notice and enjoy. And then you've got Chelsea coming out on the pitch, uh, and, and watching us beat them three 0 is going to be absolutely <laughs> superb. You heard it here first, peeps. Uh, one person also got in touch uh, with a little joke. Um, Pot on Hornet, Jason. Knock knock. Who's there? We've got Cap. We've got Cap. Who? That came from his eight-year-old daughter. Brilliant. <laughs> it was certainly better than my Harla Turin effort at Hume, because that was supposed to be a joke, by the way. Okay, Jen, big one. Very good. If you've got any more jokes, get in touch at Watford Podcast. Uh, yes, thank you for getting in touch uh, for this week and, and hopefully again in future weeks. Uh, we'll be back again next week. Please subscribe uh, if you have an iPhone uh, via iTunes and you get us for free uh, and uh, very fast every Monday, because Monday is FTRE day. Come on, you ones.